Okay, well, uh, good evening and uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for uh, being with us this evening for another rendition of Conversations from 17th and Girard, uh, which has become uh, our uh, alumni speaker series that has been established over the past year uh, during COVID and, and whatnot. But we are very honored and privileged to have as our guest this evening, uh, a legendary prep alum and a legendary figure in the world of Philadelphia basketball, uh, Mr. Phil Martelli of the Prep Class of 72. Phil, thanks so much for being here tonight. Oh, Kevin, thank you. Thank you for that uh, overwhelming uh, introduction. Phil, of course, uh, as, as many of you know, coach for many years uh, right here in Philly at St. Joe's and is now the associate head coach at the University of Michigan, uh, coming off a great season uh, up in Ann Arbor. But um, but tonight, you know, we'll, 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 you know, have a nice conversation here with Phil. We'll talk about um, his uh, memories of being a, a prepper himself back in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, his career in coaching here in Philly. Uh, he's, of course, also a prep parent uh, of, of a couple of boys, Phil and Jimmy, uh, classes of 99 and 2000. Um, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll get into all that and, and talk, talk a little bit about uh, the future, the future of college hoops and, and some other fun stuff um, here this evening. As for uh, towards the end of the uh, evening, towards the end of the hour here, we'll, we will allow for some Q&A from our, from our audience. Um, I would ask that to ask a question, um, if you would type that into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, um, and we'll try and field as many questions as we can uh, in the given time. But um, with all that said, and without any further ado, uh, Phil, let's, let's get into it. Um, so I, I would love to just kind of start at the beginning. If you could talk about, you know, growing up in the area and, and then obviously coming to the prep in the late sixties, what, what brought you to the prep? What kind of made you want to go here? What, what's kind of the story behind that? Uh, first of all, Kevin, I'm, I'm, I'm really am honored. And I thank you and, and Betsy Courtney for this invitation because, uh, I am not who I am and where I am uh, unless I had attended the prep. I absolutely uh, believe that and feel that in my bones and I've expressed it many times uh, throughout my career and, and uh, the opportunities that have arisen uh, th through basketball. But, but because I went to the prep, I believe that wholeheartedly. Um, I was a, I was a uh, playground rat, to be honest with you. Uh, I would spend, I couldn't even tell you the number of days, but I would go to Finnegan Playground uh, in Southwest Philadelphia. And when at Finnegan Playground, everybody had to have a team, a college team. And some guys followed Penn and some followed Villanova and LaSalle and St. Joe's. And we would go to the Palestra via trolley uh, every Friday and Saturday night. Uh, we would be really babysat by the 8,000 people or 9,000 people that were at the games and you had to have a team. And my team was St. Joseph's. And um, in my brain, uh, we moved when I was in the, in the seventh grade, we moved to Lansdowne, Delaware County. And I went to St. Philomena's, but I had this thing about, I'm going to go to St. Joe's university. And I believe that the only way to go to St. Joseph's University was to go to St. Joe's Prep. Uh, and like as, as we would go through seventh grade and then eighth grade and I took the test and I took the test at was, what was then St. Joe's College because the fire had occurred. Uh, I took the test and, and I got in. And I then, my parents and I were having a conversation and it was $600, tuition was $600. But I was the oldest of seven at that point. And my father was working two or three jobs and my mother was, was at home. And we were trying to figure out how we were going to come up with this $600 uh, to, to go to St. Joe's Prep. I grew up a half a block from Monsignor Bonner. Like I could see Mon Bonner's front door from my steps in, in Lansdowne. And uh, IHM nun 
at St. Philomena's met with my family and I, and they said, we have a dormant scholarship here. We have a dormant scholarship to go to St. Joe's prep given by the uh, McEwen family. And McEwen's for those that are aware, he later became the district attorney in Delaware County. He had an older brother who went to the prep and had passed away at a young age. And uh, I took myself, he lived about three blocks from us. I took myself and knocked on their door and I asked them if they would resurrect their, their uh, scholarship so that I could go to the prep. And that's exactly, that's what happened. Now, some people know this story, but I, Kev, I have to share this story with you. After our conversation last week, I thought maybe people don't know this story, but uh, I was a 13 year old. So my mother would say to me, we're going to go out on a summer day and we're gonna to go to 69th street and we're gonna take the L and then you're gonna take the Broad Street subway and then you're gonna to walk to the prep. I'm gonna go with you, but I don't want your first day of school to be the first time you did this. Now, being a Philadelphia like playground rat, I had been on public transportation and I was 13 years old and I just wanted to go play basketball and, and, and I didn't wanna be bothered with having to make this trip. My first day of school, so September of 1968, uh, my mother said to me, I, I need you to tell me this. When you get off the subway, the first police officer you see, ask him where St. Joe's Prep is. So I, I said, yes, mom, I'll, I'll do that. I got off the Broad Street subway and being numb, I didn't notice the other 300 kids in the blue blazers and we didn't even call them khakis back then. You know, maybe somebody out there could tell me what we called our pants, but it weren't, they weren't khakis, right? <laughs> and so I walked up to a police officer and I said, sir, can you tell me where St. Joe Prep is? And I now realized that he thought I was a wise guy. So he told me to go to 16th Street and to make a right and that I would see the school. So I did. And I kept walking. I ended up at seven, at 16th and Montgomery after the summer of 1968. And an elderly black gentleman said to me, son, what are you doing? And I said, so I'm trying to find St. Joe's Prep. And he said, you're about six blocks off and one block over, you better get going. I was late for homeroom. And I don't remember what I had for lunch, Kevin, but I remember I was in 1B with Father Reese, right? And I was late for my first, and I couldn't explain it. I, the, so you can imagine this, 300 kids walking this way and one nitwit going to the, <laughs> and, uh, So now to continue that story, the, the school, school ends, right? Freshmen had no lockers. We took every book home every night until we moved into the new building, right? And going home, I went back, I got on the, uh, the Broad Street subway and it was an express train to 8th and Market. Well, I had never been past City Hall. So when I got to 8th and Market, I thought I, I'm, I'm in the wrong place. I had to get back on the subway, go back to Broad Street. And when the next one came that would drop me at City Hall and then I could catch the L, I, I probably got home an hour and a half later than anybody else in the school. And when I walked in, I said to my mother, uh, we probably should have visited there in, the, in this. <laughs> <laughs> but a memorable first day, Kevin. I think that's an all too familiar story for, for a lot of guys. Just you hear it a lot. Just getting into the prep every day was was part of the experience and, and an experience in, in and of itself. So I think very, uh, very relatable for, for a lot of our alums out there. Um, I just real quick, just um, for our uh, attendees out there, if you do have a question, I would ask that you, you put it in the Q&A instead of the chat. It just helps on our end to, to sort through them a little easier. So there's a Q&A box down at the bottom. If you could type your question in there, it'll, it'll be uh, much easier. So um, kind of moving on for, from there in your first day, uh, Phil, you obviously ended up uh, on, on the Preps basketball team. Um, 
you had some some great teammates, some, some legendary teams. I, I would love for you to just talk about your experiences playing basketball at the prep, you know, some of your memorable teammates, any memorable games or moments, coaches, anything like that. Love, I think a lot of people would love to hear some of those stories. Well, having the chance, obviously, uh, and maybe there's discussion with Joe Ryan or maybe there's a discussion with others, uh, but I played with the greatest player ever to play at the prep and Mo Howard. Uh, I've made a living off of the joke that Mo and I set a prep record averaging 30 points between us in the backcourt. He averaged 28, I averaged two, but it still added up to 30. Uh, playing for Eddie Burke and uh, even, even earlier than that, John Jablonski and Dave Grandy and Tom Gorman and watching them play play at the Palestra and then saying, you know what, this, this, is, this is something uh, that, and it was selfish, something that I really wanted to do. So junior year, we just had a terrific team. We won the Catholic League championship with Billy Trusky and Tim Corlease and Mo Howard and Brian Kenny and Paul Opila. And um, we got off to a little bit of a rocky start we might have been three and three having lost at LaSalle uh, High School. And uh, the next day in practice, uh, Coach Burke said, well, we're going to move you into the starting lineup. Now, I was a very, very reluctant shooter. Um, I could pass and I, and I understood the game. Uh, and I knew that with uh, staying in, you know, today everybody talks about your role, staying with what I could do uh, would give me a chance to, to play for a great program and to play in a really difficult league. Um, so like the, those memories just, just flash back to at St. Tommy Moore and it was really their school cafeteria doubled as their gym, the West Catholic gym. Uh, but playing against, phenomenal, uh, talented guys at, at all of those schools and Eddie Stefanski and, and the late Mike Stack at Bonner and Michael Arizon uh, at, at O'Hara. And it was interesting because in the summer I would play with all those guys in, in playgrounds. So it was really, you were competing against your friends, um, having the chance to, to win a, a Catholic League championship against Cardinal O'Hara and then two Three days later, playing in the in the public league champ, I mean in the city championship against Overbrook with the great Andre McCarter, um, and, and I I have this vision of that game that we played very early on a Saturday morning, and then it was replayed. It was put we lost, but but it was replayed at one o'clock. But it was a nice day, so I went and did what I did on every day. I went and played basketball at a at a at, a, at an outdoor court in Lansdowne and people were coming up and saying, wait a second, you, aren't you watching your, I said, no, I'm not watching it. I know what happened. We lost and uh, just having that opportunity and then going with the prep team to the National Catholic High School Invitational in Alhambra, Maryland, uh, like just the guys that we, we played against there. Adrian Dantley was in eighth grade and he was traveling with the DeMatha team John Candelaria, who was a major league baseball pitcher, we played against his team. Um, just, it's just something uh, extraordinary. I, I've always said this, championships stay with you for a lifetime. You're gonna lose possessions, you're gonna lose loved ones, you're gonna lose jobs. But uh, whenever anybody asks me, well, how'd you do at the prep? I'll say, well, we were the Catholic good champs in 71. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Someone, uh, someone had asked in, in, the, in the chat, in the Q&A, um, just how good, and you said for your money, the best player in prep history, how, how good was Mo Howard? And, uh, you know, if you could just talk about him a little more. He, he, Mo was like, uh, Mo was ahead of his time. Um, he was, he, he was a, a, a spectacular finisher at the basket. Uh, and in the, that was how you scored. You, you drove the ball to the basket. And he was the first guy that I 
that I ever laid eyes on that could dunk easily. Um, and his, uh, his fierceness in, in competition uh, was, was simply amazing. I mean, he was, he was a, an all Catholic. He was a, a, an all state. He was an all American. Uh, went on and played with those great Maryland teams and played with John Lucas, uh, played in the NBA. Uh, during the pandemic, I watched a game. Pete Maravich set a record playing for a New Orleans team, New Orleans Jazz. The second leading scorer in that game was Mo Howard. Wow. And I think Pete Maravich scored 65 or 66 <laughs> points. I think Mo had 12 or 14, but, <laughs> and, 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 uh, you know, like th this is something that transpires, I think, at the prep. Mo, every step of the way, my career at St. Joseph's and even now at Michigan, he will send me a note and he'll send me a text and he'll say, hey, man, I'm really proud of you. And to, to come from a guy like that and then, you know, and we finish the text with I love you. That's because of, of the air at 17th and Girard. That's great. That's great. Love hearing that. Love hearing that. Um, all right. So we, we'll, we'll kind of move on. Um, you know, you, so you leave the prep and, and you go uh, play at Widener. And then um, what, what, so from there, did anything happen? What, what got you into coaching? How did that kind of start up for you? Actually, when I was in, uh, when I was in the ninth grade, I was so enamored with the CYO coaches that I had uh, postman, by the name of John Steele, a banker by the name of Tom Gallagher, and a Delaware County politician by the name of Pete O'Keefe. And I remember when I was in the seventh and the eighth grade, watching them take this group of like, just different personalities, and I didn't know it at the time, but different skill sets, and, and to practice and to, I, I just caught this bug about basketball, because I believe basketball is the greatest societal experiment because it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you go to the prep or you go to Bishop Eustace. It doesn't matter if, if you live in the city or you live in Chester County. It's a game where if you can dribble, pass and shoot and you can compete, you can play it at all ages and all places. And I, I, I just remember that. So when I was in the ninth grade, I would go back and say, hey, can I coach in the summertime? Can I coach the fifth and sixth grade team in the summertime? And as I, got older, I just would coach younger guys. And then when I went to college and I really wanted to play because it was the pursuit of championships, uh, uh, I would go back and coach independent teams. And so when I, got out of, when I got out of college, I said, you know what? I, I want to coach in the Catholic League. So Bud Gardler was just named the coach of Cardinal O'Hara and uh, I didn't know him. I had met him once and I wrote him a note and he, he let me uh, be the JV coach at Cardinal O'Hara for one year. Um, it, it, the game, the game, just like it, it, everything about the game, not just the strategies, but the, but, but the teamwork and the, and the, uh, the, the ability to, to help one person. That's what captured me at a very young age. And I, and I, uh, everything I did, every decision that I made uh, to teach in the Catholic school system. So I, my first job was I taught at St. Martin of Tours on Roosevelt Boulevard. I made $4,000, <laughs> but it allowed me to be the JV coach at, at, at Cardinal O'Hara. The day before school started at St. Martin of Tours, I got a call from the Upper Darby School District my only question to them was, what time do I get out of school? And they would say 345. And I had already agreed to coach the JV team at O'Hara and I had to be there at 330. And I was like, I can't do this. And I also thought like the power of the Mac nuns, I thought if I turn my back on this Mac nun, she's gonna keep me from ever coaching in the Catholic League. <laughs> well, which is what I wanted to do. I wanted to coach in the Catholic League. I wanted to coach and teach because to me it was the best competition with these coaches that have been so um, so powerful in my view of of what coaches Eddie Burke and Speedy Morris and 
and Jim Purcell at, at O'Hara, I, I was just enamored with that league and being having an opportunity to coach in, in the Catholic League. That's great. I mean, it just shows goes to show the, the impact coaches can have. I mean, not just from a you know standpoint of, of you know making a great team, but but from you know influencing young men like you to to want to follow in their footsteps more or less. So that's uh, really cool to hear. So so you, you start coaching, uh, you, you start at O'Hara, and then and then just if you would just take us through kind of your kind of the rise through the ranks uh, over the next you know however many years. So I, I left, um, I coached one year at O'Hara and then I had a chance to go back to Widener uh, to be an assistant coach. And when I went back uh, to Widener, we played for the division three national championship. We lost that game. Um, and I was still teaching at St. Martin of Tours. And so I was going from, I was married. I was living in Clifton Heights. I drove to Northeast Philly and then drove to Chester to coach basketball. And in the summer I worked uh, with Kathy Rush, who's in the Hall of Fame. I worked at her summer basketball camps. I ran those camps. Uh, my th so my third year, there's an opening at Bishop Kenrick High School and it's in the Catholic League and Mike Lynham was there, Bud Gardler had coached there. So I was fortunate enough to get an interview and to get the job. And uh, my first year, I was 23 years old, and I thought I knew, and, and I always say this, thank God I got dumber, therefore I got better at the, at the craft of, of, of coaching. Um, I had a terrific experience, a terrific experience at, uh, in Norristown at Bishop Kenrick. Uh, young guys that really bought in, uh, a, a full commitment, 12 months a year, basketball, um, and a very supportive, uh, father, uh, Joe Murray hired me and, um, had a chance to play in a Catholic, in a, in a Catholic league championship game. We played against the Roman Catholic, uh, uh, lost to them in the Catholic league championship. Uh, and then I had an opportunity to go to St. Joseph's as a restricted earnings coach at this point in my teaching. I'm now teaching at St. Gabe's Hall, the protectory. Everybody there is court adjudicated. Uh, I'm teaching there and I'm going to St. Joe's uh, every day. Uh, great team, team that won the uh, Atlantic 10 championship, played in the NCAA tournament. And uh, that July, Jim Boyle had an opening for a full-time coach and he said, I I'd like you to, to do this. And so I went there for 10 years. I was an assistant under Jim Boyle. I stayed with John Griffin. And then similarly, John Griffin walked in uh, maybe on a June day and said, I'm, I'm not gonna do this anymore. And I, and I hope you get the job. And, and I, I, I went after it, I pursued it. Um, I had only interviewed for one job. Ironically, it was another Jesuit school. Uh, I had interviewed at Loyola, Maryland um, and I didn't get that job and I, went through the interview process and got the job at St. Joe's and, and it was always, it was never about a job. It was all, I would tell people I was going to my passion. My passion, passion was coaching basketball and teaching young people and hopefully having an impact. And, um, and, and then I had just a terrific, terrific run uh, at St. Joseph's with, with memories and relationships uh, that will last my lifetime. Yeah, of course, as, as many of us all know and remember. Um, and so, so right about the time you get the head coaching job at uh, St. Joseph's, your, your boys are kind of getting to high school age, I believe, should be right around. And, and of course, they, uh, they end up going to the prep. So, so now you're, you're kind of, you're looking at it from a parent's point of view. And, and was there, was there a battle at all? Was there any, any, you know, choice of the, in the matter, were they going to the prep uh, for sure? Or, or how, take us through that process as a parent. That, that, that's a great question uh, because I had this memory pop into my head the other day. Um, so my son, Philip was going into ninth grade and he wanted to go to the prep. Uh, and, uh, and my wife and I had agreed and 
you know, all the conversations about, well, how about getting in and out? And look, you know, the, the young dudes out there, they, they don't get it, but you know, they get bust in there. Like they're not, they're not out there thumbing it on Girard Avenue or they're not walking to the broad street subway. Uh, but, uh, and, and this is honest. I didn't have the money. I, I didn't have the money to send him to the, I don't even know what the tuition was. So I remember I met with my father-in-law and I met with my father and uh, uh, I said to him, look, I'm gonna need your help. I'm, I'm gonna do everything I can. And Al Zimmerman was involved and he was great. Uh, and I just didn't have the money. And then all of a sudden that summer, that's when it, so before Philip started ninth grade, I became the head coach and I had, I, I didn't have like play around money. I had, but I had, I, I could make it. And uh, boy, I, I, with my son, Jimmy, it was kind of different. Jimmy, Jimmy was everywhere from Roman to Carol to Bonner to, uh, and that's kind of how he was. He was all, all over the place. Uh, but then settled in and because of, he saw the experience uh, that Philip had and, and um, it, like just living that, I told you that story that, that, that uh, I walked down the hallway when, when Phil was in ninth grade and the back corridor back past what was the principal's office. And I, and I think it's the same layout now back in the back corner was a counselor and a, and uh, I was meeting with the counselor for uh, something with him in ninth grade. And I looked at a bulletin board and it was a big newspaper article that says St. Joe Prep grad, head coach at the university. And I thought, man, they're talking about me. <laughs> and uh, it touched me, it, st it still does to this day. But, it, but, but for all those parents out there, and, and if I, I, I know this. I have a. I obviously have great belief in God, and God has a plan, and all that other stuff. But I. But I will emphatically state to you that I know that God was in the same place that I was four different times at the prep, both Kairoses for my sons, and both baccalaureate masses. I know He was there, and I know. I know. You know. I don't want to be sappy, but I know He's got a lot going on. And it could be a lot of places. I am dead convinced that on those four occasions, I felt him. Uh, and, I, and I've said to everybody, whatever you've paid, Kairos, the return from Kairos and baccalaureate, you would pay double for having had those experiences. Absolutely. No, I can, I can vouch for it myself as an alum and haven't been through a couple of Kairos retreats as well. It's an incredible, incredible experience, but I, I love hearing you say that. Um, funny enough, the, the office here at the prep who runs uh, the Kairos retreats is our mission and ministry office. And one of the, one of our newest members of that office, at least in, over the past year, is a former player of yours, uh, Eric Woods, who's also uh, a prep parent uh, currently. Um, he has just been an, been an awesome, awesome, uh, had an awesome impact on the prep and is first year here and running a lot of the service um, programs here at the prep. But, but I know Eric was thrilled that you were doing this and um, has nothing but great things to say about you. I wonder if you have any, anything to say about Eric or any memories of Eric uh, from his time as a player. The Eric starts with his home. Like he's a representative of his mother and father. And I can remember visiting with them and talking to them about him coming from St. Louis and, uh, how engaged his mother was with his summer, uh, uh, his, his summer basketball team, um, and then like knowing that he had a younger brother who grew into be a tight end at Michigan State. So that's pretty serious being a tight end uh, in the Big Ten. But there is a thing about Eric that that a lot of people don't know. But at the end of of Eric's either junior or senior year, I think it was his junior year, he came to me and he had not played a lot. Uh, he was a terrific leader, uh, but he came to me and said, you know, 
I've always wanted to play baseball. He played, he played basketball and baseball at St. Joseph's. I did not know that. And uh, uh, I was always proud of that you know, because I go all the way back to when I was a high school coach at Bishop Kenrick and it would always be like, well, you can't have him. He's a, he's this. And I thought, man, to Eric to have the courage to come and ask and for the baseball coaches at the time to, to, to uh, have him do that. So he was a division one basketball player and a division one baseball player. Wow. How about that? I, that's you, I, I learned something new there. So I'll have to, I'll have to bring that up to him next time I see him. Um, Couple of questions in the in the chat. Uh, wondering um, can be from I guess really any time from your from your coaching um, career. Um, who would you say is was the most skilled player you ever coached? And then maybe on a little different one, who was the most dedicated player you ever coached? Or if a couple come to mind, uh, it's, it's all good as well. Wow. Um... Most skilled player. I mean, it's easy to say, it's easy to say Jameer. And he would also, Jameer Nelson would also fit in the dedicated. I just had a conversation with him uh, yesterday. He's working with the Sixers and they were doing some intel on Michigan players. And um, he and I would talk about when I would be out and about in Philadelphia speaking or seeing a high school game and I would drive by the old field house at St. Joseph, you could see the lights. And if I could go by at 10 o'clock or, or coming off the, the Schuylkill at two o'clock in the morning and the lights would be on, I know it was him. He was in there. Uh, it was him uh, and Delonte West being w working on their game. Um, and his, his, the leadership that he brought just, uh, he just, He's just on that that top of the mountain uh, for me. But but uh, Pat Carroll, Pat Carroll was a really good player and played on great teams. And then everybody left, and he, and Pat was a good shooter, and he became a national level shooter. And he had a a, a way of working that if he had a ten o'clock class, he knew he could shoot from eleven to twelve. Uh, uh, and the skill of shooting was uh, absolutely, uh, he perfected it. And it was because of hours and hours and hours and hours of being in the gym by himself. I've often thought that to chase greatness, you have to go on the path that's least crowded. And so in basketball, you have to go into the empty gym. As a student, you have to go into the empty library and uh, that's the path. That's the path to greatness. Um, but all of these, the like the Langston Galloways and him, him making it through the G League to or the D League at the time to to the NBA, is because of of the skill, the skill of of uh, of shooting a, a basketball, and the most dedicated. Uh, the fiercest would be uh, really anybody that got a Division One scholarship. I thought that they had to have a fierceness about them. But I've always shared this story about the player that had the most impact on me uh, was a 15-year-old that I cut. A uh, kid by the name of Johnny Custer. Uh, I cut him when he was a sophomore because he was too small. I was convinced that we would not win a Catholic League championship. And um, he came back as a junior and, and made the JV team and came back as a senior. He hadn't grown, came back as a senior, all Catholic. Wow. Played in the Palestra in the Catholic League for Bishop Kenrick. Got a scholarship to college to play basketball. And he came from a family that they, they wouldn't have been able to afford sending him to school. And I've often said, that guy, he taught me a whole lot more than I ever taught him. So it was all about dedication and it was all about this drive to reach his dream, which was to play for Bishop Kenrick High School. Um, just an extraordinary guy. He crossed over to the dark side though. He became a referee 
Oh, geez. Oh, well, <laughs> we'll forgive him for that. We'll forgive him for that. But that's now it's a great story. Um, all right, let's move move on. You know, we'll get we'll get a little more present day here. Um, you know, you're coming off a really you know, great season at Michigan. Obviously, ended didn't end the way you guys would have liked, but it, but a great run nonetheless through the tournament. Um, you know, you were top of the rankings really all year. Um, you know, I'd love to hear just about about the season. Um, you know, obviously, a, it was a different season given you know COVID and the restrictions, and then obviously with the tournament, you're kind of in a bubble there. Um, so, so anything you could tell us about the season, you know, memories, good stories, and, and uh, you know, and we'd love to hear about it. I think that the, uh, a lot has been made about the sacrifice of the players and the f- sacrifice of the coaching staff. Um, but I think that, that we're short selling a group that really sacrificed a great deal. And I'm talking about across the spectrum of, of college basketball, and that's parents and families. Like to not be able to get to see your son play college basketball. And I, and I don't care what the level is like, but that like resonated with me all year long, the sacrifices that these players made at Michigan, seven days a week of testing and waking up every morning. And there's a little bit of angst. Like if, if they missed if they missed their testing, they were declared positive. So then that went into all like, Okay, so the first part of your day, did everybody get, was everybody on time for testing and then practicing and playing this game and a really a beautiful style of play, a very uh, unselfish team, team that played uh, high level entertaining basketball uh, with talented guys and not having crowds and, and to, to manage that. Uh, and then we had a, we had a 21 day stoppage not because of anything a variant came in from out of the country with one of our other student athletes um but just having like this this almost this bubble around us all the time and to have them the players be so successful and win the big 10 championship was um was a real pleasure now when we went to the big 10 tournament in indianapolis uh, it was not as restrictive a bubble, but there are things that you go, uh, wow, that was pretty serious. We were, we were quarantined on the 18th floor of the downtown Marriott. And Judy uh, came out to see the Big Ten tournament. She was on the 17th floor. She could not come to the 18th floor. So for the Big Ten tournament, the interaction that we could have is, we could meet outside the hotel and, and walk around the city. So it was a much softer bubble. When we, were, when we were selected on that Sunday, selection Sunday, then it was a serious bubble. You could not leave, you couldn't leave the hotel. Uh, you could go to the, you could go to the um, uh, convention center, which was connected to the hotel. You could walk there, or you could have an escort take you to a minor league baseball stadium. You could walk outdoors and they had, I don't know if they had that smash ball, whatever that is that they play on the beaches and they- Spike ball, I think. Yeah, spike ball. Yeah. <laughs> so that was something for the players, but they had to sign up. Staff could go go at any time. So uh, that, that experience was, and there was no congregating. And Kevin, you could tell like me not congregating. And <laughs> so I probably knew somebody on 60 of these staffs of the 68 teams and you were supposed to just keep moving. I, I probably broke that rule a number of times. Uh, I would have ended up in jug if we were still at the press. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, one of the really cool things was, was seeing my son, Jim, cause he was with VCU before they, they had an outbreak and they, they went home and, uh, in walking through the convention center, knowing that they were practicing, we were on our way to practice and to see him in the hallway um, for the first time since June was, uh, was really neat. Uh, my wife came, my daughter came to the, to, the, to the Sweet 16 games, but I never saw them. I could wave to them in the crowd. Um, so there was tremendous sacrifice. And, and I think that's, like the joy that we had because it was 
we were so tight. And also the disappointment that I still feel to this day for the families not having had that chance to share this great joy with their, with their children. Can't imagine. Yeah, it's got to be tough. But um, a question came in um, talking about, you know, if you could talk about the difference kind of between coaching at a program like Michigan, Big Ten, high revenue, you know, athletics are, you know, the top, top of the, uh, you know, priority list there versus, you know, a St. Joe's University um, or elsewhere, you know, what, what are some of those differences that kind of come through when you're, when you're at that, you know, big, big state school like Michigan? Uh, everybody has a job. So that's, well, what does that mean? Well, the person in charge of phones, he's in charge of phones. And the IT person's in charge of your computer. And the nutritionist is in charge of nutrition. So when they say basketball coach, it's recruit, it's recruit, and it's coach the team. And to be honest with you, like when people will say, how are you doing? I'll say yeah, that part of it is great. But not having uh, as much engagement in the community, I, I loved where I could make a difference at a grade school, if I could make a difference speaking somewhere or coaches versus cancer was a, a passion. Like I miss that. I miss my family, but I, I miss that opportunity. But here's the example. Michigan has a practice field dedicated to its band. Okay, I'm going to repeat it. The band has a practice field. The Say no first, more. I was driving, I was driving, uh, to a couple stores, uh, maybe my third week there. And I looked at this field and I thought it was a community football field. And then I thought, well, maybe it's a junior high field. I'm like, boy, it's really nice. And I drive by and there's a sign. This field is dedicated to the Michigan marching band. And I said, <laughs> this is how big it is. It, it, yeah. It's big. Um, uh, and, and, that, and that carries over. The arenas are bigger. The players are bigger. Not better, but they're bigger. And uh, what I have found is, and I'm not comparing it to the Atlantic 10, the coaching in, in the Big 10 is, uh, is just extraordinary. They're outstanding, outstanding, um, outstanding uh, offensive coaches. Uh, and that, that would be my thing. Every, everything is just bigger. You know, it sounds, sounds corny in a way, but the charter plane is bigger than the charter plane. At the, at the end of my time at St. Joseph's, we were chartering most places. And um, it, it, it's, it's the right word, the Big Ten, yeah. because everything is big. <laughs> <laughs> That's simple enough. Yeah, that works. Um, and how about... If you could go back a little, maybe the, you know, what's the big one or two differences? It might seem obvious to us, but maybe, you know, below the surface between being a high school coach and a college coach. Um, wow, that's a really, that's a really great question. I, I'll give you a similarity. Like, sure. it, it, similarity is this. Uh, that you forget the game, forget the game. You are a coach. You are a coach. You are a teacher of people. And we can never, ever lose track of that. It's about the people. It's not about your expertise in a two, three zone. It, it, it wasn't, it wasn't Gabe Infante's expertise on a two coverage defense. It was about the people. And so, so, that would be the similarity in, in, in uh, the college coaching. You have, you're, you're cognizant of the fact that these young guys have dreams that go beyond, right? And in high school, if you're fortunate, you have a couple of guys that maybe could play college basketball. College, every guy on your team has a dream that he's going to play for money. Doesn't necessarily mean it has to be the NBA, but he's going to play for money. And so 
there, there's, um, th there's an importance uh, in, in how, you, how you deal with that and how you, how you interact. Uh, and I think there's a difference in relationships. A college young guy is a young man and your responsibility as a college coach is to take him to manhood. You know, accent whatever has, uh, or augment, augment whatever has happened at home uh, to get him to be a man. And in college, I mean, in high school, you're dealing with kids and you're, you're, you're hoping that along with their teachers and their administrators and their families and their community leaders that we can get them to be young men. Uh, so, but, but again, being similar, it, it's about relationships. It's not about knowledge. And it's, and it's really not about like, Kevin, you know what? I, I can't believe this, but I, I can watch seven fil films. Yeah, but but are you aware that this kid's struggling a little bit because in high school, maybe mom and dad are having troubles or, you know, maybe maybe that chemistry class is harder. So that that's that's a big deal. It's, it's a really big deal. And I would say this about the high school coaching in Philadelphia. I was fortunate that I got the take the path of going to St. Joseph's and pursuing college basketball. But, you know, everybody at the prep lived it. Speedy Morris is a Hall of Fame coach and Jim Fennerty at Germantown Academy and Bill Fox when he was at Father Judge and Bud Gardler at Cardinal O'Hara. Those guys in terms of coaching basketball, they're elite level. Um. That was a great answer, honestly. It really, uh, I think that, that, that hit home for a lot of us. Um, how's, how's your, uh, going back to Michigan uh, more specifically, how, how's the relationship been with, with Jawan Howard and working with him? And, um, you know, just talk about that, that uh, relationship, if you could. Uh, Jawan and I had had just brief interactions, uh, really not anything with regard to basketball. The, the, uh, their team, the Miami Heat had come and practiced one time and we set them up. And another time I saw him um, recruiting, he was out watching his sons play. Um, so, so when this opportunity came about and, and he and I would have conversations, I was always interested in what are you really about? Like, you're not the Fab Five, right? You're a guy that was on, was with the Fab Five. And you're not a guy that was the sixth player taken in the draft. Like, like who, who are you really? And the thing that struck me was he had tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, love of family. That was number one to him. His family mattered the most. And he had tremendous love of the institution, Michigan, what it had done for him. And I said, you know what, the, that, that resonates with me. With the other things, you know, how we're gonna coach offense or, or how we're going to recruit, all of that can be worked out. Uh, as long as I'm with somebody that, that understands that, that others, the institution, others lifted him up and that family had to be most important. And um, what I would say to people uh, is the fact that I'm heard, I don't have to be listened to on everything. I don't have all the answers. I mean, I have as many questions as the, as the next person, but I know that in a meeting uh, I can be heard. And over this course of time, uh, Juwan Howard has become a really, really good friend of mine. And um, I think that what resonates with me, Kevin, is um, I work with Juwan Howard. We work for Michigan. There's a big di there's a big difference, and you know there's a lot of young guys out there and say, "Well, I I work for Dan Hilferty." Well, no, you work with Dan Hilferty. You work for IBX. Uh, 
and that's the way I feel. And um, e even now, like I've been home since April the 9th. There's no pressure, like you got it. No, it was I have both vaccines. I haven't been home since August 30th. I didn't have family visit a lot this year. Okay, go home and, you know, just come back in the, towards the middle of May so we can be ready for June recruiting. He gets it. He's, he's, he's a really, really, really good person and a developing coach. That's great. No, it's, and, and it even seems to come through just from, um, you know, that relationship you're talking about, just from, you know, watching on TV um, in the middle of the games. Um, so I know on, on the call tonight, we have, you know, a handful of current parents. We have, we have some current students, some of whom are, uh, have, have aspirations uh, in, in the world of basketball. Um, so do you have any advice for, you know, a current student, a high school student who, who has aspirations of, of playing uh, at the next level? And, and maybe, you know, what would that advice be? Uh, one thing that I would suggest is that uh, play the game with joy. You know, don't get caught up in, in rankings or, 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 or uh, don't, don't get caught up in comparing yourself to someone else. Uh, if every day, if every day you can get up and improve as a person and you can improve as a student and you can improve as a player, then the game will get back to you. It will, it will clearly get back to you. Don't get it out of whack though. Like who you are as a person and who you are as a student is mixed together on how far you can, you can take this game. And there's a place for everybody to play. Uh, not everybody has, not every will get a scholarship. You know, we're going to talk about the transfer portal. Transfer portal is, is, is stacked against high school players, but find a place where you can have joy in your pursuit of getting better. Um, and then earlier in the con conversation, I said about, you can't be afraid of the empty gym. If you're the only one in there, that means that you're a little bit, you're getting a little bit better uh, than, than, the, than the next guy. So um, look, I'm enamored with the game. I, I, I've always been enamored with the game. And as I said, it's such a great societal experiment. But to go to school, to go to college, and to have that as part of your day, have that as part of your semester, have that part of your year, boy, it's a great way to go to school. Great. That's great. So you, you mentioned it, you brought it up. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts kind of on the, the kind of the direction college basketball is going right now with, you know, like you said, the transfer portal is, you know, the, the wait a year has been cut off, you know, because of COVID, you know, seniors can come back and play another year. Um, and, and we're seeing, we, you know, we discussed a little before the call, there's an article in the inquiry the other day talking about how some of these high school players are kind of getting left behind a little bit. I, I would love to get your thoughts and your opinion on the direction that's going and, and any other kind of future thoughts for the, for the NCAA and, and college hoops in general. Um, I'm not a table banger and, but this, the combination of the, the extra year and this, what they call the one-time exception for you to transfer, to put them in together uh, is going to, people are going to get, lost in this situation. So I think I checked this maybe an hour ago. We're now over 1600 kids who are transferring wow. from division one. Now quietly, Kevin, quietly, women is at 1100, but we don't talk about women's basketball, right? We talk about 1600 and, uh, and you have guys coming back from the draft who, who are declared for the draft. That's, that's going to have another push for kids, uh, and if you do the numbers, 1,600, 300 schools, that's over five kids per school. There's some teams that are completely wiped out and are building up brand new teams. I worry about that because I don't know if I'm a fan. If I'm a fan 
of Wyoming. And I followed this kid's career and all of a sudden he's gone. Uh, but by the way, we had this kid coming in for a year. Um, I don't know how I get as excited about my school's team. Um, I, I think the, the combining that, I don't know that they understood everything uh, of all of the ramifications and the collateral damage. And the collateral damage is that there are high school kids who should get college scholarships who are going to get left out. Because if I can get a 20 year old kid who's played two years of college basketball, as opposed to a 17 year old, I'm taking the 20 year old kid. Uh, I also think that this rule is weighted for the, for the top schools. And, and I'm gonna raise my hand, I'm gonna raise my hand. And, Last year, we don't win the Big Ten. We don't make the Elite Eight. But we have a point guard uh, come from Columbia. Now, he graduated, and the Ivy League does not let you stay a fifth year. I, th I think they just changed that rule. But uh, so we benefited from it. This year, we're looking at point guard and saying, well, do we put a freshman in? Well, we went and got a, a, a transfer from Coastal Carolina. He was the best player in his league, and now he wants to come and, and pursue a championship. Is it right? It's the rule. And I, I, just, I just worry about how our middle level schools are going to keep up, or are we just gonna keep almost like, you know, the, the commercial sometimes of the, the big fish eats the fish, and after this, he. I'm afraid that that's what we're doing, but we're going from the top down. Um, and it'll, it's gonna be really interesting. I think that we will have a lot of enthusiasm next year, but I think the same thing is true of the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, I think the Philadelphia Eagles are gonna have 70,000 people. They're gonna be really excited because it was gone for a year. And we're not gonna have 70,000 people who are going to be arguing well, Carson Wentz is better than Jalen Hurts. I mean, it's, I mean, some of that's going to happen. It's Philadelphia. It'll happen eventually after a few games, you know. It'll happen in Philadelphia. <laughs> but 70,000 people are going to buy their tickets. Um, and so I think people think it'll settle down. But even if it settles down to 1,000, it just doesn't feel right the direction that we're going. Um, and I was on the forefront, I was in meetings and I was on committees and, and they just have this tremendous fear of the NCAA of it looks awkward that five sports didn't have it. Hockey, hockey, uh, men's and women's basketball, uh, football. And there was one other sport where they didn't, they didn't, they had to sit a year. Uh, Mathematically, it makes sense to me, like you have a better chance of, uh, of, of graduating. Uh, you're not gonna lose credits. I mean, transferring, you, you lose these credits. And if you're only gonna be there then four years, you know, it, it's rough. Now, to the NCAA's credit, paying for summer school, letting us work out with our players in the summer has helped kids kind of catch up and accelerate the, their their degree work. So, um, I, I look. I raise my. I don't like it. I really don't like it. And I do think that it is continuing the separation of the haves and the have-nots in college basketball. Gotcha. Well, we're coming up on time here, so I'd love to get you out of here on this question. You mentioned the Eagles. Um, well, the 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 other another professional sports team in the cities getting ready to start their playoff run this weekend. Uh, I'd love to get your, maybe a prediction, some thoughts on, on how we think the Sixers, Sixers might do in the playoffs here. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm fascinated um, uh, with the job that Doc Rivers ha has done. And uh, I think when he has blended these personalities, which I think are completely different personalities and, Ben Simmons, who seems a more of a laid back uh, kind of blend guy to Joel Embiid, who, uh, who 
is over the top in terms of personality and engagement with the city and, and, and that kind of thing. I think that the, the acquisitions that they made to get older with the, with the Danny Greens and now George Hill, who I think will play a significant role uh, in the playoffs. I, I think the Eastern division is, is going to come down to Milwaukee with the Greek freak and Brooklyn with that all-star team uh, that they've created. Uh, but I, if I was a Sixer, I, and I am, obviously I'm a Philadelphia fan, but uh, I think the Sixers are in for a very long, a very long May, a very long June. Uh, and then when you look at those monsters in the Western Conference, uh, I, I can't, I can't go that way if, if uh, you know, the Western Conference has, and the MB people will be upset, but the Western Conference has uh, Jokic, who will be the MVP, and Steph Curry, who probably should be the MVP, most important player or something like that. Uh, but it's, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be, really great uh, in Philadelphia and they're going to up the crowds. And I know that the prep has a, I, I, I follow everything on, on, uh, on social media. And I know, I know they have a 76 er trust the process club or something. We do like indeed. We, those yeah, guys, it, it, yeah, that, I'm gonna tell you, those guys, and I don't know any of them, those guys interest me. And, and the, uh, the broadcast, what, what, uh, the uh, WSJP. Players. Yeah. They do a great they, job as well. It yeah. really interests me. Cause I'm like, wait a second. Those same kids did the state championship in football. And the other day they're doing the senior day yeah. for volleyball. They're all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So I have great appreciation. Uh, I have great appreciation for, I have great appreciation for everything that goes on at the prep, but those two clubs in particular interest me a great deal. That's great. Now it's good. It's good. You're taking notice and people are taking notice. Well, listen, Phil, we're right. We're, we're just over an hour. Um, uh, we're going to wrap it up there. I, obviously I want to thank you uh, on behalf of everyone here at the prep. We are incredibly proud to, to count you am, among our ranks as, as an alumnus. Uh, you've been nothing but, but incredibly supportive of, of us here at the prep um, and the, and the students here. And, and we love obviously here and that you, you know, still, still keep tabs on, on everything, but um, just a, just a heartfelt thank you for, for joining us tonight and, and for all you do for us at the prep. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. And, and uh, for a very long time, I, I just, just want one quick story. Yeah. Uh, my mother, uh, God rest her soul. She, she said to me one day, I said, what did, what did you think was special about the prep? And she said, the prep taught you how to write, and how to speak in public. And I had never processed that. This, this was a, a while ago. And uh, that has resonated with me uh, because we all know, our moms know more than we know. And, uh, and I've often said, uh, I've been to a lot of schools. Uh, there's just something that makes the prep the finest high school in America. And it, it has nothing to do with buildings and it has nothing to do with programs and it has nothing to do with you know, great football teams or anything like that. It's the air, it's the air and the way that every young person that walks in that building is treated with respect. We need more of that in this country. Well, that seems like a good place to end it there. So thanks, Phil. Uh, we wish you the best of luck as you, you head back to Michigan and uh, don't be a stranger. Hope you, hope you come back to the prep soon. We can, uh, we can see you. Thank you for including me, Kevin. Absolutely, anytime. Thanks, Phil. Right. Good night, everybody.